It's my pleasure to welcome our participants to today's Antimicrobial Stewardship Project webinar titled Making Stewardship Programs Globally Relevant and Dissecting the New Guidelines. This webinar will be presented by two highly accomplished international experts, and we're very pleased to have them today, Dr. Celine Puccini and Dr. Debbie Goff. I'm Marty Peterson. I'm the Global Outreach Coordinator for the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project, which was created by the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. I would like to note that this webinar is based on a consensus paper published recently this month in the journal Clinical Microbiology and Infection, and both of our speakers are authors of that manuscript. So a little bit of information about our speakers. Celine Puccini is a professor in infectious diseases at Nancy University Hospital in France and a member of the Public Health Research Unit at the University of Lorraine, where she coordinates Antibiovac, an interdisciplinary project to research the current use of anti-infectives and vaccines in order to prevent the emergence of antibiotic resistance. Dr. Puccini is Secretary of the European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases Study Group for Antibiotic Policies, Vice President of the World Alliance Against Antibiotic Resistance, Coordinator of the French Infectious Disease Society Antimicrobial Stewardship Working Group, and a partner in Drive AB. She has lent expertise to the French Ministry of Affairs and Health National Antibiotic Plan, the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, and the World Health Organization. Finally, she's an associate editor for the journal Clinical Microbiology and Infection, and in 2017 received the Eskman Young Investigator Award. Dr. Deborah Goff is Infectious Disease Specialist and founding member of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center in Columbus. Dr. Goff is a member of the OSU One Health Antimicrobial Stewardship Project Committee and also leads the research program for the Department of Pharmacy. Dr. Goff is a faculty member of the American Society of Health Systems Pharmacists National Antimicrobial Stewardship Mentoring Program and the International Advisor to the Federation of Infectious Diseases Society of South Africa, educating and mentoring South African healthcare providers about antimicrobial stewardship. Her interests include antimicrobial resistance, the application of rapid diagnostic tests with stewardship interventions, and the use of Twitter to increase global engagement and cross-collaboration with surgeons, oncologists, veterinarians, and patient advocate organizations in the realm of antibiotic stewardship. She lectures nationally, internationally, as an antimicrobial stewardship advocate. So two highly esteemed um, international experts here today to speak with us. For our participants, I would just like to uh, note that we really want to hear from you um, and engage with you related to our webinar today. And there's a chat box located at the bottom right-hand corner where you can submit questions or comments to our speakers today. And then I'll just remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded. And so if any of your colleagues have missed it today or you would like to review it at a later time, it will be available on our YouTube channel at a, at a later date. So thank you very much for joining us today. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Puccini to begin our lecture today. Thank you, Marnie, for the introduction. I'm very pleased to give that webinar with Sidrup. That's an honor. So I will talk about uh, the paper we wrote with many experts around the world. So. Uh, uh, the paper was published uh, very recently in Clinical Microbiology and Infection. You have all the information here. It's open access, so you can access the PDF uh, for free, actually. And you see the long list of people, actually, uh, coming from many, many countries that have developed this work. So, a bit of background. I think everybody knows that antimicrobial security programs are insufficiently implemented worldwide. May of, because of many, many reasons, but one of the reasons is that we lack a consensus definition of what antimicrobial stewardship is, and we lack a consensus definition of what are the core elements, the essential pieces that should be part of an AMS program in hospitals and in other settings as well. When we look at the literature or at guidance, we see that in North America and Europe and in Australia, we have consensus lists of core elements that are considered essential for successful AMS programs, but we don't have that kind of consensus 
for other countries and mostly for low and middle income countries. So that's why we developed that, that work actually. So our objective was to develop a set of essential core elements and their related checklist items for AMS programs. And these elements and items should be present in all hospitals, regardless of resource availability around the world. That was the objective we had in mind when designing the study. For that, we used a two-step approach. First, we did a literature review, so on PubMed, and we also reviewed all relevant websites, for example, ECDC, WHO, CDC, and many others, without any language restriction to retrieve a list of core elements and checklist items that could be relevant globally. Then we compiled all things that could be relevant in hospitals around the world. And this list was evaluated by an international group of AMS experts using a structured modified Delphi consensus procedure with two phases, uh, so two online in-depth questionnaires. And we did that uh, at the end of 2017, uh, and the paper was then published recently. The experts were asked to select all core elements and checklist items they felt were essential worldwide and should be part of AMS programs in all hospitals and in all countries. So we had in mind that we wanted minimum essential items, not too much, not too few, just really the basic essential things that should be part at the very beginning everywhere in the world in our hospitals. So the elements and items were selected if agreement between the experts was 80% of or, or or above that. So a very high level of agreement because we wanted these elements to be really valid actually uh, for all countries. They were held for reassessment during the second round of the questionnaire if agreement was between 70% and 79%. And then they were rejected at the first round if agreement was uh, under 70%. The experts were asked uh, at both phases of the questionnaire, the so first round and second round, to, to, to suggest new elements and items for further assessment in addition to rephrasing. We thought rephrasing was very important because uh, most people do not speak English as their native uh, language as I do actually, and we wanted to have a, a phrasing that was as generic and easily understandable as possible. And then the newly suggested elements and items that were uh, suggested by the experts during the first round were considered for inclusion in the second round if at least three experts out of 15 made the same suggestion. So I hand over to Deborah for, for the results. Thank you, Celine, and uh, good morning or evening to everyone that is on our webinar. So let me go through what we found after we worked together collaboratively on this assessment. So there were 15 global experts who have experience implementing antibiotic stewardship programs in different types of settings. We represented 13 different countries and six different continents, so really a global initiative. So 48 references were reviewed and we developed 29 checklist items with seven core elements. So in reviewing them, we maintained the 28 checklist items. So we retained those. We added one new item and it had greater than 80% agreement amongst us. And 20 items were rephrased so they were applicable um, outside the English speaking language and making sure that all settings could understand the phrase that we use. So we really wanted to provide a baseline of key elements required to start antimicrobial stewardship in the hospital setting, no matter if it was a high resource country or low middle income country where the resources are far different. Um, they could be further modified and used for accreditation or certification or benchmarking within the own each hospital individually. 
So it was a consensus-based process, and we identified these seven core elements, leadership commitment, accountability, drug expertise, action, tracking, reporting, and education. So let's look at these in a little more detail. For those in the United States, these might seem very similar to the seven core elements of antimicrobial stewardship that our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention developed and published. So we agreed with those. Um, our list is a little bit more comprehensive and more generic, um, really reflecting our objective of trying to be relevant to any hospital worldwide. So let's look at a couple of these in a little bit more detail, because this is really what we want to connect with our audience uh, on this webinar today. So if you look at core element one, senior hospital management leadership towards antimicrobial stewardship. And when you look at this, your checklist items, there are several, if we just look at these three, has your hospital management formally identified stewardship as a priority objective for institutions and included in its key performance indicators. So as an antimicrobial steward, we might have great goals and intent, but if hospital management is not on board, the program will not succeed because you need to have them on board. So that's really the first step. If you're new to stewardship, trying to implement this in your hospital, the senior management has to be supportive. Checklist item two was, is there a dedicated, sustainable, sufficient, budgeted financial support for stewardship? Support for a dedicated salary, training of the personnel, information technology support. And in my experience working in low middle income countries, there is none. And so that doesn't mean, although this is on our checklist item, that you can't succeed. You absolutely can, as we can provide examples around the world, specifically in South Africa where I've worked. So you may not have a full-time dedicated clinician to stewardship, but you can carve out one hour a day to start it. You may not have dedicated financial support for an information technologist dedicated to stewardship, but they can include this within their day-to-day -day activities. But the key is you have to have hospital management on board. So sometimes the money doesn't come right up front um, because there just isn't any to designate. Or once you engage with hospital management, there is money to run a hospital. It's a matter of where they want to choose to spend that money. And that's where the skill of in, uh, describing the importance of antibiotic stewardship, maybe existing funds can be repositioned to support some stewardship activities. So checklist item three, does your hospital follow any national or international staffing standards for stewardship? So um, the goals of full-time equivalent per 100 bed. Well, I practice in a 1,400-bed hospital, and I know we don't meet the standards that are recommended just because um, that's the way it is in terms of financial support. We certainly have support. Um, does it exactly meet these standards? Not optimally, but we have a very successful stewardship program. So you can't use the standards and checklist items that we have here as reasons to not start stewardship or say, well, we don't have sufficient funding, therefore we can't succeed. You have to find a way to work around these. And remember, success builds upon success. So if I look back many years ago to when I started stewardship at Ohio State, um, I was given 50% time. So I wasn't given four full-time equivalents to start the program. Sometimes you have to succeed with very minimal uh, financial support and you build upon that success. In South Africa, we implemented a very successful stewardship program with a single one hour dedicated time per day. So you might have to start small and you build upon that initial success. Imagine what you can do if you can prove success with one hour a day dedicated to stewardship 
and you use these checklist items to build upon that success. So we believe these items are very key and instrumental um, to the success of stewardship, but please don't take these as an item list and say, well, I can't accomplish item two and three, therefore I won't even start. Um, everyone can succeed. These are the goals we're working towards. So accountability and responsibility, such an important component. And I want to focus here on item number two. Is there a healthcare professional identified as a leader for antimicrobial stewardship activities at your hospital and responsible for implementing the program? Now, in, in most countries, that leader is going to be a physician. But what if there is no physician that is willing to step up and add this level of responsibility to implement this program? Then maybe a pharmacist should step up, or a nurse should step up, or an infection preventionist. Someone has to start. Stewardship is a collaborative effort, and we need everyone involved, but someone's got to get the ball rolling. So again, in South Africa, this was a barrier. The physicians, incredibly skilled, but just could not envision what hour of their day they were gonna do this. So the pharmacists stepped up, and as they started implementing stewardship, the physicians came on board. But the idea of starting a new program can be overwhelming. So again, most countries, this will be led by a physician, but it may require someone else actually starting it. The goal is you have to have someone that's the point person identified as the leader of the program, and that clearly has to be spelled out. Let's look at the next point. Available expertise on infection management. So do you have access to laboratory services and timely results to support the diagnosis? Well, in many countries, just obtaining cultures is a financial barrier. So I've been in several hospitals where their microbiology lab, there's just not funding available to get cultures and repeat blood cultures every day till negative. So you have to get very creative in um, working with the resources you have to work them to the best capability that you can. So the microbiologist needs to be part of stewardship, obviously, to try to coordinate these efforts. Now, if you're in a hospital that has microbiology support and you can obtain cultures and you have the ability to utilize a rapid diagnostic test, that's great, but you have to have the results sent to someone in a timely fashion to make a difference and make that rapid diagnostic test financially feasible in your hospital, and that will require coordination by a stewardship team. So that's how the whole process has to work together. Let's look at item 3.2. In your hospital, are there or do you have access to trained and experienced healthcare professionals? The medical doctor, the pharmacist, the nurse, infection management, diagnosing, preventing, and treating? and stewardship willing to constitute an antimicrobial stewardship team. Well, again, I'll defer to my work in South Africa where there are about only 20 infectious disease trained physicians for the entire country. In the United States, we do not have enough infectious disease trained physicians or pharmacists to go around to every single hospital. So do not let that be a barrier to starting stewardship and saying, well, we don't have an infectious disease trained physician or pharmacist, so we don't have the expertise. Well, every physician has training in management of infections, but they will need additional training to really become an expert to lead an antimicrobial stewardship program. Because to lead a program, you need more than just knowledge in infectious disease, you need also the skills to lead, and that sometimes is not something that's taught in medical school or pharmacy school or nursing school. So there may be additional training, 
And where can you get that training? Because that's another challenge. Um, attending conferences and meetings are wonderful, but again, um, who pays for that? So what if you're in a very resource-limited country without uh, support by your hospital to attend conferences? What is available? Well, education and practical training is part of our checklist. So does your hospital offer a range of educational resources to support training? Um, can these resources be developed locally or not? And you need multiple formats. And again, someone has to take the lead on this. So when we look at checklist item 4.2, do the antimicrobial stewardship team members receive regular training? Well, who's offering that regular training? That might be the stewardship team, or maybe it's a regional, national, or at an international level. So what is available if you don't have the resources or time to develop a training program? What type of training programs are available that don't require funding and um, expense? So there's many wonderful programs you can attend, but sometimes the financial uh, registration fee is a barrier in many countries. So I do want to take a minute to talk about some of these free opportunities to provide knowledge for antimicrobial stewardship. And you need to train yourself before you start the program. So the first is this brand new global free antimicrobial stewardship online ebook. It's an electronic book. You can download it free. It was developed by um, Dr. Natwani as the lead, head of BSAC. And many experts around the world collaborated in contributing chapters. This is a really novel book. I had the great um, pleasure of contributing a couple chapters. And in a chapter, you're not going to just sit and read. You're going to be able to link to an active podcast, slides narrated by the speaker, hands-on experience from people around the world with diverse backgrounds, it's really, I think, one of the most amazing free stewardship learning opportunities that I would encourage you to look at. The other is the SIDRAP organization that is hosting this webinar today. They provide real-time daily updates of published articles around the world. They provide news updates from the WHO, ECMID, the CDC, Welcome Trust, and more. You need to sign up for the free SIDRAP stewardship newsletter that will come to you electronically in your email. But they are my go-to daily site for antibiotic stewardship updates. This webinar will be posted there to be heard at a later date by anybody, anywhere. It is a phenomenal resource, and I would strongly encourage you to go to the SIDRAP ASP website every day for breaking news of articles and many other opportunities. The Centers for Disease Control has a toolkit for antibiotic stewardship that is free and can be accessed by the website, along with a plethora of many other great opportunities. So this is not a barrier to education. There are many free resources to become a educated expert in antimicrobial stewardship, no matter what country you are from. Um, the opportunities are unlimited, and that was the goal of our paper, is to include these different steps of core elements necessary for a successful program. So in summary, we feel we published an evaluation framework for hospitals to succeed in antimicrobial stewardship. Our goal was to provide a relevant across both resource-rich and resource-limited countries as we clearly recognize the resources are different. But as someone who has helped implement stewardship in countries such as South Africa, Nigeria, Algeria, Vietnam, extremely resource-limited countries, 
the 15 experts brought that type of hands-on experience to the publication to create the metrics that are necessary to succeed. We clearly recognize all of these will not be in place when you start, but we can't afford to not start. And leaders have to come to the forefront and start somewhere. Maybe it's just one hour a day, but that's a great place to start. So in conclusion, what are the next steps? Please take this article that we published and evaluate it for its value, its feasibility in your country, which represents a range of geographic and resource settings. We want your feedback. It is welcomed. My Twitter handle is at IDFarmD. I engage daily, as does the Twitter handle for SIDRAP underscore ASP as a very easy, quick way to engage with stewardship experts. Dr. Pulcini's email is there also as the lead author of this article. We would appreciate your feedback as we continue on the journey of global antimicrobial stewardship. So with that, I think we can turn to any questions that have come in from our audience, and I turn it back to you, Marnie. Wonderful. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Shalene, for the overview of this um, seminal paper, consensus paper that's been published. Uh, just taking us back to, I'll just start off with uh, just a few, a few questions here. Um, so taking us back to your goal, is to, you assembled the experts, 15 experts from these 13 different countries and representing the different continents. And I'm curious as to, you mentioned that what you ended up compiling was a, a bit more comprehensive and a little bit more generic uh, core elements that may be slightly different, similar but yet slightly different than the CDC core elements. So I'm curious in your in the, in the work on this manuscript, when you have the low to middle income countries participating, what were some of the um, core elements that ended up being different or needed to be highlighted that weren't represented by the CDC original core elements? Maybe Celine, you want to yeah. Uh, comment first. So, so if, we, if we compare to the CDC ones, actually the core elements are pretty much the same. The phrasing is different because the phrasing sometimes was too much American for, for, for some people. So we changed the phrasing, but the core elements, that's the same meaning. For the checklist items, actually, if I remember well, only 12 of our checklist items over 29 are the same, pretty much the phrasing is different, of course, but the same meaning as the CDC wants. And that's because uh, the CDC checklist items were, of course, adapted to the American context. And that's different in other parts of the world. For example, the composition of the AMS team, we want it to be very flexible, very generic because you need to adapt to your setting and to your resources. And also some intervention strategies were too specific. We wanted to be very broad, actually very structure oriented. So we did not include that. And in addition, we included many more things that were we thought relevant to low to middle income countries and also high income countries. For example, availability of resources, of infection management, so, yeah, I think the perspective was, was a bit different, actually. So, so Debbie, if, if you want to comment? Yes. Um, so, one of the other items I clearly remember, and through my own experience in other countries, the Minister of Health needs to be part of the um, prioritization of stewardship for their country, which is a little different than how it functions in the United States. It's really each individual hospital uh, was making that decision. And so that became, I remember, one part that really needed to be incorporated because an individual hospital leader can feel this is important, but if it's not viewed important by the Minister of Health in that country, it really won't move forward. And in the public hospitals um, that are funded through uh, the government of the country, 
um, there will be no funds if the Minister of Health doesn't see it as an important prioritization. So that was one key aspect in uh, the countries outside of the U.S. that I remember being different and addressed in our checklist items. Thank you, Debbie and Shaleen. So just in the conversation that, that the explanation that Debbie brought to us about core element one, and I think it's it's probably important and to why you have it as element one, is the getting the buy-in from the senior and hospital management. It sounds that in the particular countries that also includes the Ministry of Health. So I think that you, you mentioned that's absolutely critical. Um, and just to talk then further about how were there are there specific tools for engagement with the senior management that may be different in the low to middle income countries versus uh, it's some of the more developed countries that you've noticed in your experience? Perhaps, Debbie, you can speak about that. Sure. I think Algeria represents um, one of my more recent examples. And I think what um, becomes important is they had a national meeting of uh, physicians and, and infection preventionists and microbiologists probably about 500 people, and it was focused on antibiotic stewardship. And the Minister of Health was present and opened the meeting. And that, to me, um, is the first step, because when the hospital leadership that was present at the meeting sees the Minister of Health saying, this is important for our country, I empower you to start this process, um, she's not there telling them how to do it, but giving her support. And that is the start in many of the low middle income countries. The Minister of Health has got to be engaged. And so for everyone to be in one room seeing the message come directly from that Minister of Health, this is important, our country needs this done, patients need this as we're running out of antibiotics, very powerful message. And to me, that was um, always in the back of my mind as I was contributing my part to these core elements. That is what makes stewardship succeed in a country. That's how South Africa started. So if you, you know, individually try to start without that leadership support, um, it generally will not succeed. Uh, and that was the format that was successful in the first step starting in Algeria. And then having these experts all in one room allowed for an interactive discussion because often we really function on our job in a silo. You, you talk physician to physician, pharmacist to pharmacist, and sometimes in these countries, the professionals are not engaged in a really um, interactive discussion about patients. And so those hierarchy barriers have to start breaking down for stewardship to work. And that's part of what can be accomplished when you're in a meeting with a diverse group of healthcare professionals with the Minister of Health really setting the prioritization of stewardship for the country. Uh, Marnie and David, just, just a word. Actually, the, the paper really focuses on the at the hospital level. We included in the discussion all the points that are raised by Debbie and are, are critical. We need, of course, national structures and the national governance in place to implement stewardship efficiently at hospital level. But we did not develop core elements and checklist items at national level. That was not the goal. The goal was the hospital level. Uh, but we have some documents, uh, for example, in Europe or at WHO level that talk about uh, national structures that are essential to implement stewardship. And of course, this is critical uh, and we must, of course, deal with the national level. But usually it's not the same people. That's uh, two different uh, levels, I would say, uh, of action. So, uh, Debbie, Selena, I'm not sure if you can see. Thank you for that follow-on information, Selena. I think that's an important point. Um, so, I wanted to bring you to a question that's been submitted. I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but um, it's with regard to the staff and getting buy-in from the staff at the at these local hospitals. 
in the low to middle income countries? And then are you able, is there turnover or are you able to then continue to enhance their leadership roles around stewardship? I don't know if w, you've got some experience in that area. So engaging the staff, someone has to take the lead to provide hospital specific data to engage the staff. Um, if they do not understand why the hospital needs stewardship, they will not engage or comply with whatever you're starting. Because, you know, part of stewardship is really behavior change. No one's going to change their behavior that they perceive to be delivering good medical care and without any awareness of consequences of what they're currently doing. So, for example, in some countries, um, you know, I've observed meeting one-on-one -on -one with the microbiologist and, and seeing shocking um, uh, resistance rates of gram-negative pathogens, Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, um, profound drug resistance to last resort antibiotics, yet somehow that data isn't translated in a meaningful way to the physician and prescriber of the antibiotics. So, you know, that is where the initial steps start. You have to have, why do we need this at our hospital for our patients? So that is the hospital level stewardship first goal is helping the medical staff and everyone engaging. Um, why do we need this? And until they understand the why, it's very hard to get people to change any behavior. So that's really step one, and that's addressed as part of our core elements. That's the education component of stewardship. Yeah, I completely agree with Debbie. Uh, it will be stewardship is a strategy associating multiple actions, actually, and strategies at the system level and also the prescriber level, the non-prescriber level, and, and the public, actually. So in all the resources Debbie showed, you will find a kind of menu of interventions you can choose from, and you will associate multiple actions. Of course, the staff turnover is a problem. We all have that. But if you keep doing actions in a sustainable way, in the end, it will pay off. You will get results. And you need, we didn't show that, but one of the core elements is monitoring and reporting. You, of course, need data to, to convince people that there is a problem and that you, you have succeeded in some ways. And you will report data to them in a meaningful way, as Debbie has, has said, for, for them to, to be motivated to change even more, actually. That's, that's a very important point. Um, and I'm wondering if the two of you could talk a little bit about, we didn't cover the, the tracking and reporting, but if you could talk a little bit about the recommendations for what to track and report. Sure, I, I, I could start. There's so many different things, but you know, in a hospital that is just getting started, um, you know, one thing that we did uh, very successfully in South Africa uh, which is on a paper chart system. So I think we have to acknowledge everybody doesn't have electronic health care records. So many countries are still in paper charts, and we all know how challenging that is. That means someone has to manually tabulate data for monitoring. But it is possible, and you don't need a big complex IT system developed to start documenting your interventions. And one of the simplest ways to start, and this is a way we've engaged pharmacists that in many countries are not actively involved in um, the decision making of antibiotics, they're more involved in the delivery and dispensing of antibiotics. I say you can implement one of the first steps in stewardship is, are the antibiotics delivered in a timely fashion and actually administered to the patient? So in some hospitals, again, referring to South Africa, as I watched the process in a paper chart system, um, you know, a physician can write the most effective antibiotics for their patient in sepsis and write the order stat, but if it takes 
six hours to turn the order around, which is actually what occurs in many hospitals in a paper chart system where the paper order has to find its way down to the pharmacy, um, that process can take upwards of six hours to turn it around. And then it's delivered to a medication room so the nurse doesn't even know the antibiotic has been delivered. Imagine why you'd see no change in the mortality rate of sepsis because the patient didn't even get the antibiotic for six hours. So that's an avenue that is a stewardship intervention, and that can be what we refer to as the hang time project. Start just documenting how many hours does it take from when a doctor writes an order to the nurse actually infusing the antibiotic. What is that turnaround time in your hospital today? Every pharmacist can contribute to collecting that data, and that's not any complex database. That's, you can do that on a piece of paper. That's step one of stewardship, and you can document that. And you can start building from that. Because if you can improve that process, which um, is a challenging process in many resource-limited hospitals, um, that is step one. Just assuring you have antibiotics on hand. Many resource-limited countries do not have a plethora of antibiotics to pick from. They have a handful. They're not even available all the time. So, you know, those are ways we really have to create checklists that are applicable um, in all sorts of settings. And I think that's what we tried to accomplish to do. So again, um, what data you're collecting depends what resources you have in your hospital and what level of stewardship you're starting at. So that was an example in a very resource limited step one of stewardship in a hospital. Um, Celine, I'm sure you have examples throughout Europe, um, not quite as resource limited or um, just starting out, but again, um, I'm sure you can provide different types of examples. Yes, many thanks, Debbie. That was really, really, really nice example. So um, we didn't use the term tracking actually in our paper because it didn't mean much to non-English speaking people. So we used monitoring and surveillance because it was more meaningful to people. And we did, didn't go actually into uh, the level of details describing the specific interventions to put in place. That was not our goal. We wanted to, to describe the broad range of action a stewardship program must implement. So we only said for monitoring that the hospital has to monitor the quality of antimicrobial use at the unit or hospital level. We didn't provide any example because that was not the goal of the paper. You can do that by many, many ways. You can do point prevalence surveys, you can do audits, you can do automated measuring, you can do several things depending on the resources uh, and also the regulation at national level if that exists. Then we wanted also to monitor compliance with the interventions the stewardship team implements. For example, if the stewardship team implements, uh, you need to, to put the indication for each antibiotic prescription because, because they think it's important, they need to, to document that there is compliance with that intervention. Then we also uh, focused on monitoring antibiotic susceptibility rates only for a range of key bacteria. So each hospital, each country has to decide what is key uh, according to, to their setting. And then the final item is the quantity of antimicrobials prescribed or dispensed or purchased. That depends on the way you can have the data in your country and in your hospital. And then for the reporting, actually, it was the same thing. So it was quantity of prescribing, quality of prescribing, and antibiotic susceptibility rate. So we were really generic because uh, we wanted countries and hospitals to be able to adapt to, to their context, actually. Thank you, Shaleen. I guess it takes me to um, the final topic or question here regarding um, what's next for the working group. Do you have next steps where you're working with some of these countries and individuals to help them, uh, you know, obtain some of this information or data to help them guide the next tools we can develop or 
through the surveillance and that information coming in, how is that helping us to understand some of the global issues, some of the global problems? So I'm kind of wondering how the working group may move forward with the next steps related to as some of these things start to may, maybe go into action and become implemented. Yeah, actually, Debbie will will comment as well. Um, we are uh, testing the the checklist items and core elements in a range of countries, so having feedback from people, and then we also send actually the paper to to WHO, uh, and WHO is currently developing some very practical resources for stewardship, and they will come up with a national stewardship core elements and checklist items, and the same at hospital level. So I don't know what what the output will be, but but I think uh, they will probably uh, at least use some of our results uh, in their in their guidance documents. Debbie, did you want to do any other follow-on comments related to that next step? Yes. So okay. Um, I am contributing to that WHO working group, so we are working to develop um, more specifically the guidance for low middle income countries. So the current article that we just discussed was for all hospitals around the world, low and um, high income countries. But we clearly recognize low middle income countries have different barriers. And so um, this article is being used and we're working together um, with the WHO to develop a specific low middle income country guidance. So it's exciting. And then, you know, the authors of this paper are from all different countries. And so I know in South Africa, Mark Mendelson, who's one of the co-authors that we worked with, um, you know, we are utilizing this as we um, extend stewardship into the public sector hospitals, which are far more challenging and far more resource limited. So we are involved in um, really looking at the applicability of this within South Africa, and uh, we'll provide feedback. So I think it's a very exciting global initiative and really collaborative. And, you know, to me, it's, it's why we do stewardship. It's a global healthcare problem. So to have so many um, experts and, and people around the world willing to work together is quite exciting. I agree. I think that that's the part of the highlighting this paper today is all the different experts and countries and different perspectives and settings that you brought together to provide uh, such a unique tool that can be used across the, the globe. So I congratulate you on, on all the people that you were able to assemble across the globe. Celine, do you have any uh, final comments uh, to our participants today regarding the use of this the, the consensus paper and um, some of the core elements that you set forward or any other comments you'd like to provide to us? Oh, I first would like to thank you a lot because I think uh, we will change things if the paper is known by people and used by people. So we really welcome any feedback you may have from, at, from your country or from your hospital if you think the list is useful, is applicable or not, uh, and the modifications you would like to, to bring actually to, to the core elements and checklist items. And I I'm really hope, and we all really hope, uh, that it will bring about some changes and it will probably, I hope, motivate your country, country and your regulation body to yeah, implement some guidance and to help people start stewardship programs at the hospital level. So, right, really grateful to the, to the old group of experts. That was real fun. Lots of work, but uh, I think a nice result, and uh, we hope that it will be useful to all the stewards in on the planet, actually. Thank you, Shalene. Debbie, any final comments or thoughts from you? Well, I just um, encourage people to provide feedback, whether it be through email, Twitter. Um, we are looking to engage people and, and are doing our best to cre create guidance, but it really drills down to the individual hospitals. And so 
you know, we're always open to learning from individuals. So please engage with us and we welcome your feedback. Thank you. Well, with that, I will close our webinar for today and thank Debbie and Celine for walking us through this very important paper that they co-authored with all of their global experts and colleagues. And I just wanted to thank our participants as well for joining us today. We really appreciate your support. And to remind all of you that this webinar was recorded and will be available at the SIDRAB AST website uh, it's very shortly. So please feel free to share this with your colleagues. And also the link to the manuscript is in front of you in the chat box, but also if you re-review the webinar, it again, it again is in one of the first slides of this webinar that you can have access to. And please provide feedback to any one of the entities, specifically its authors, uh, Celine Puccini and Debbie Goff, so they can, again, continue to provide the tools and the information that you need. With that, I'll close, and thank you very much. <laughs>